any given day of the week, our news media, whether television, radio, web, or the paper, report on stories of human suffering. We hear about civil unrest and riots, violence and war. They tell us about the destruction caused by hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, and blizzards. We also hear of the devastation to human life caused by famine, drought, and the epidemic spread of illness. Those are just some of the kinds of stories that we hear detailing great sorrow and pain. And yet, literally billions of individuals around the world experience daily suffering that is never published and may not even be known by anyone else. As we consider the awful truth and reality of suffering, we must come to the realization that even God's people often suffer. And many times their suffering is more than the godless or rebellious unbeliever. That's because many Christians suffer because of their faith in Jesus Christ. This persecution can range from verbal abuse to torture and even death. But no matter the severity of the persecution, we must consider the reality that many of God's people are suffering today. So Dr. McGee brings us to the first and second chapter of the fascinating book of Job. He has given today's sermon the title, Why Do God's People Suffer? We hope that you'll be able to turn with us in your Bible to the book of Job with an open heart to hear from the Lord. You know, it was during his 21-year pastorate at the historic Church of the Open Door in downtown Los Angeles that Dr. McGee first gave this sermon. Before we get to it, though, let's hear from some listeners, those specifically to our foreign language broadcasts. This first letter comes to us from Algeria, where our Kabyle broadcast reaches the Berber people of the Atlas Mountain region. The listener writes, It gives me great joy to be able to write you this letter, thanking everyone on the radio team for your program. As you know, our country is spiritually dead. Even I had always said that there is no hope for this country. However, lately I've come to understand that God's Spirit is blowing throughout the land and touching our hearts. I'm convinced that salvation is coming to Algeria. It's my prayer that Algeria will be saved. I pray that many Christian workers will come and help in the fields of Algeria. With each one of us working together under the leadership of God, Satan and his evil ways will be defeated. I want to also mention the wonderful work that is taking place in the church. The leaders are relentless in their walk with Jesus, and they are doing a wonderful work. I pray that God will continue to bless and protect them. Well, will you pray for the people of Algeria? that the Spirit of God will continue to open the eyes of the blind, that they may come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Our next letter comes to us from a listener in Africa who hears our English language broadcast, and he writes, I wish to express my appreciation and gratitude to God and to yourselves for the continued broadcast of your program through the Bible. The program is of great help and very important to both Christians and non-Christians and can lead people to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. To Christians such as me, it builds us up and strengthens us in our faith and in our love to God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. In the program of the late Dr. J. Vernon McGee, he teaches many biblical principles which should be applied in life on earth for the well-being of all mankind, such as the death penalty. I would like to thank God for the guidance that he gave to the late Dr. McGee in establishing a radio broadcast service for the preaching of the gospel and the teaching of the true word of God. I wish to assure you that I listen to the broadcast on your Through the Bible program and will continue to do so as long as I live. Next, we have letters from two listeners who hear our Persian broadcast and are greatly blessed by the program. The Persian language program, by the way, can be heard predominantly in the country of Iran as well as many of the surrounding areas. The first listener writes, I have to congratulate you for inviting people to turn back to the only Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Every day, I feel like I am, figuratively speaking, caught in the paws of a wolf which is trying to eat me. Thank you on behalf of myself and my family that you are showing us how to live according to the teaching of Jesus Christ. After listening to your program for some time, I recognize that even though I believed in God, I was not a believer. I am 18 years old and born into a traditional Christian family. We knew about Jesus from what our grandparents told us. We did not have a Bible and never went to church. When I came across your radio program, it was an answer to my prayer to learn more about Jesus. Thank you for becoming the river of life for us. And our second letter from a Persian listener reads, When I was 17 years old, I was sent to jail because I had in my possession literature that it was against the government. I spent many years there. I saw and experienced how prisoners are tortured in the name of God. 
After I was released from jail, I searched for the truth and for peace for my soul. I had lost all hope. Then I came across through the Bible radio program that talked about hope, love, and kindness. Slowly my pain went away and was replaced by a seed of hope in my heart. I am alive in Christ. My faith started because of your program. When my family and I escaped to another country, I had some of your programs recorded, and along with the literature, we were comforted during our time of transition. I continue to follow Jesus, and I pray you will continue to spread the gospel to many other peoples. Well, how wonderful to know that the Word of God is having an impact all over the world. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless your Word today as it goes forth. May it bring comfort to hearts burdened by the reality of suffering. We pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Can God control evil? Or why do God's people suffer? The most profound book in the Bible is not Leviticus or Ezekiel in the Old Testament. And it's not Romans or Hebrews in the New Testament. But the most profound book in the Bible is the book of Job. It was perhaps the first book in the Bible to be written. For Job lived sometime after Abraham and before Moses just where we do not know exactly. There are some that attempt to pinpoint him at the time of Jacob. That could well be, but we have no evidence for that other than what is in the book itself. The book of Job deals with the basic problems of life and destiny. The bedrock issues that confront us today are dealt with in this book. It grapples with the enigmatical problem of evil, the origin of evil, the reality of evil, the purpose of evil, and the consequences of evil. In the book of Genesis, we have the origin of the universe. But honestly, friends, though so much attention has been given to that, that's not as important for you and me to know as the origin of evil. The fact of sin and the presence of evil just cannot be debated any more than the reality of this universe. Evil is it's woven into the web and woof of creation, and it is actually a part of our lives today. Some, I know, have tried to deny the existence of matter and the presence of evil. But my beloved, if this world in which we live is real, and it is, so is sin. Sin is a reality. And it's axiomatic, I think, to state this morning that both the world in which we live and evil are a reality today. Paul, for instance, in Romans, he does not labor the question. He doesn't even attempt to prove uh, that man is a sinner. Uh, Paul just says, evil is present with me, and he doesn't attempt to prove it at all. He accepts it as an axiom. He does not attempt to prove the point. The question of sin is a declaration in the Bible, and it's not a debate at all. Now, I think you find that in the book of Job, the same thing is true as in the epistle to the Romans. With this addition, the instigator and the originator of evil is ferreted out and pointed out and, and pointed up for us. And we see God's relationship with evil and man's relationship with evil, and it's put, put in a proper perspective for us. Now this morning, very briefly, I want us to look at this drama, for that is what it is, as it opens. We have Act 1, and in Act 1 the book opens on a scene of tranquility. The birds are singing, the flowers are blooming, there's not a cloud in the sky. Man is at peace, and the total climate is salubrious. I'm confident that if Browning had been living at the days of Job, he'd have been accurate in Pippa Passes when he says God's in his heaven 
all's right with the world. Seem that way. When you enter the book of Job, will you listen? There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil, that is, he shunned evil. And the word perfect here is not uh, the word perfect as we think of it today. In the New Testament, the word perfect means full maturation, full growth. But in the Old Testament, and especially here, for there are several words that are translated by the, uh, Greek, uh, the English word perfect, it means to be out and out for God, 100% for God. And it can mean, and the suggestion is here, of sincerity. Job was a sincere man in his relationship to God, and he was out and out for God. That's what it means. Now this man, we're told, there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. In the Old Testament, we're told that children are a heritage of the Lord. He was blessed. Then we're also told his substance also was 7,000 sheep. This is the inventory. And 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. 500 she-asses means they were used for their milk. It was a delicacy in the East. It means that this man was a man that lived in luxury, and this was a man that was certainly in an affluent society. He had uh, and enjoyed physical prosperity. This man was a, was a capitalist, and he lived in a capitalist society, and there was no threat of dialectical communism on a global basis in his day at all. And then we're told something else. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day and sent and called for their sisters to eat and to drink with them. Uh, there was an ease and a comfort of an affluent society, the type of wealth and luxury that produces a culture. And Job enjoyed all of that. It, it was easygoing. Uh, he was relaxed. There was no tension but undisciplined, that is, his children were. They were not going to the mission field. As far as I knew, not one of them ever volunteered to go. None of them ever really served God. That disturbed Job. And may I say to you, you and I live in an affluent society. And the figures given at Moody Church over a year ago revealed that in our schools today, Christian schools, less than 10% are going. And uh, we've just come through a missionary conference. We were thrilled when we saw these Indian Christians here, the Amuscos. I'll never forget their visit, nor will I forget my visit to them. But back of the Indians was a missionary, a young man who went down there 19 years ago in the name of Chloe Stewart. May I say to you, his color was bad. You noticed that. He was undernourished. He was overworked. He had on an old suit. And when we took a retiring offering here on Thursday night, you folk were really generous. And we made him take enough money to buy a new suit of clothes. And did you know, we're not sure he did it, because he wanted to give it to something else. He did not want to take a thing for himself at all. May I say to you, down in Mexico, orchids grow wild, but here in the United States we grow orchids and children in hothouses. And that's the way Job was raising his family. And they were not going to the mission field, you may be sure of that. Will you notice it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. He was a concerned parent. 
prosperity and creature comforts cause men to turn away from God. It's causing many today. We're seeing the rise of atheism and agnosticism, and we are told today that in many schools young people are coming out where they should come out with a real positive testimony, coming out with doubts in their minds. Christian professors today seem to be more interested in, in Bootman and Barth than they are in the Bible. This is a day of supermarkets and a midget God. This is a day in which you and I live in a land of plenty filled with spiritual paupers. Saints today are filling their bellies with the husk of fads and cults and isms. And many preachers today are giving out gospel goodies instead of standing up and preaching courageously the gospel of the grace of God. I had a preacher, and there are many of them now, that are beginning to preach against tongues as we did at the beginning. A man called me this past week, and he said, For goodness sakes, get your tape to me in a hurry. It's got into my church. And I said, If you would have had courage enough a few months ago to stand up and preach out against it, then, my friend, you could deal with this sort of thing today. Oh, I tell you, we're living in a day of weakness, if you please. Up in San Francisco the other day, the roving reporter asked the question, will there be a judgment day? I wish I could give you the answers he got to that. Here's one. No, I figure it this way. And this fellow's a teamster. It's just as if I would step out to be an authority to tell John Glenn how to make his next flight when I'm entirely ignorant. But this fellow's got his idea. The Lord puts us on earth and he governs our actions. So why would he want to judge us? He knows pretty well what's coming off. I think there is a heaven and I think everybody will go there after death. That's his idea. But that's not what the Word of God teaches, if you please. We're living in a day that wants it easy. And believe me, friends, you're not popular if you make it difficult today as God has made it. Now, will you notice that this is a scene here, this first scene in Act 1. Up to this point, there's nothing to ripple the still waters. There's nothing to disturb or interrupt this scene of insouciance. This is no fairy story, however. It's a real story. I wish you could say they lived happily ever after, but they didn't live happily ever after because Back of this scene is the unseen. There are two interested spectators to the life of Job. They are likewise participants also, and they're going to change Job's little world radically. We come to Act 2. And I want to say to you, without Act 2, it would be gross distortion without the remarkable disclosures that are here. And so we shift from earth to heaven and see things that only God himself can reveal, my beloved. Will you notice? Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. May I say that's certainly a revelation, is, is it not? That into the very presence of God goes Satan. He's not in hell. Hell's not even opened up for business yet, but it's going to be. And Satan's not there. He actually goes into the very presence of God here, and he's in opposition to the sons of God. And here he stands, Satan, the antagonist and adversary of God. But Satan means adversary. It means something else. It means hater. It can be said God is love. It can also be said Satan is hate. That's what he is. He's not a son of God, but a creature. And the remarkable thing here is he's responsible to God, and he has to go there to turn in his report. What a remarkable revelation. And then will you notice, the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, 
and from walking up and down in it. Satan had to report to God concerning his activities. Every creature must stand before Almighty God. Every creature must give an account of his life, his actions to God. I wonder if you've ever noticed over in Psalm 76, verse 10, Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, the remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. God says that I make even the wrath of man to praise me, and that which will not praise me, I won't even let it happen. Los Angeles is not as bad as it could be. God won't let it be as bad as they'd like to be. No man yet has been able to go the limit in evil. There is coming a day when for a brief moment God will take the lid off and he's going to step aside and he even tells his own on the earth, do not even resist evil. He's going to give it a brief moment. But up to this morning, God restrains evil, my beloved. Now will you notice, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, one that's out and out, 100% for God, one that shuns evil. These are the two spectators now to the scene of serenity in the land of Uz. These two, God and Satan, have been watching Job's little world. And both of them have been watching it with more than passing interest. Now will you notice something, and this is another remarkable disclosure. I read verse 9, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? He cast a reflection on God. He says, Job doesn't fear you just because he wants to or you are worthy to be feared. He doesn't do it for nothing. You happen to be paying him. An awful thing. It's a blasphemous thing, and I'm of the opinion the angels of heaven the sons of God shuddered. Will you notice now? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. How did Satan know about that hedge that was about Job? I'll tell you how he knew. He'd been trying to get through it. And God had been watching it. And now he asked him, You have been looking at my servant Job. You haven't been able to touch him because I got a hedge about him. And now Satan has to blurt that out and say, There's a hedge about him and I can't touch him. And he could not penetrate it without the permission of God. What a revelation. About the child of God today, there is a hedge. And Satan won't get to you unless he gets the permission of God. He has to have it, or he can't touch you. Now will you notice, Satan, but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. My friend, Satan has no use for the human family. He despises mankind, and the reason is he knows this pretty well. It was the philosopher in London years ago who said, the more I see of mankind, the better I like my little dog. Satan would agree to that. He despises men. And he says, this man, Job, you are paying him. If you didn't pay him, he'd turn his back on you. My beloved, that's a tremendous revelation, is it not? And will you notice now verse 12, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only 
only upon himself put not forth thine hand, so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord, and he makes a beeline, goes like a, the flight of a crow, directly to Job now, because there has been made a wedge in the hedge, and Job is going to be got to now for Satan's coming through after him. My beloved, Satan can only go so far. But I, as I read the book of Job, he went far enough. But he can only go as far as God will permit him. Job lost everything that men hold dear. He lost his finances. He lost his family, his seven sons and three daughters, and his physical body. Finances, family, physical body. He lost all of his possessions. He lost the thing that he loved more dearly than anything else, his children. And then his own body was racked with disease. Some think it was actually cancer. Seemingly there was no human explanation for the trouble that Job was having. It was not a punishment for sin, for it was not in his life. And my beloved, what happened to Job was senseless without the insight of this scene that we've looked at. What was happening to Job was for a lofty and worthy purpose. There was good and sufficient reason in the eternal counsels of God that this should happen. When all the facts were in and all the facets were considered God was doing the thing that was right and permitting what happened to Job. Now this morning briefly, I mentioned too, it was first of all good for Job. You say, I can't see how it could be good for the man. May I say to you, I find it a little difficult myself, but I have the statement of the man. And I turn over to the 16th chapter, verse 12, and I want you to listen to Job now and he's in the midst of his trouble. Everything's happened to him now, and he can't explain it. And his, uh, his three friends are beating him down and attempting to brainwash him. And he says, I was at ease, but he hath broken me asunder. He hath also taken me by my neck and shaken me to pieces and set me up for his mark. When well, he says, God's put me out here and he's shooting at me. And I'm the bullseye that he's hitting every time he shoots. That was the reaction of this man. The thing that was happening to him, he couldn't understand it. Sort of like the old chestnut about the father that was whipping his little son, Willie. And the father says, son, this hurts me more than it does you. The boy says, yes, dad, but not in the same place. This thing was uh, hurting God, if you please, but uh, may I say to you, the trouble is coming to Job, and he couldn't understand it, and he had to learn what you and I have to learn sometime. His ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. You know, today we would deliver our children from suffering. We'd prevent it if we could. We'd give them everything that we can afford to make life better for them, there is a father here this morning that told me, he says, I regret the day that I ever gave my boy a, a car when he went away to college, but he thought he was doing good for his boy. He intended to do everything he could for him. There came a day when Job realized that something good was coming out of his experience. You listen to him, he's deep in the experience now, and in the 23rd chapter, verse 10, listen to Job. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. What was happening was actually good for Job. And during the testing, Job did not understand the purpose of God, and I am not sure whether Job ever understood the purpose of God in this life. 
Listen to him. Back in the 23rd chapter, again, verse 1, Then Job answered and said, Listen to this man. And I tell you, he is now at the bottom of the totem pole of life. Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. He says, if you think I'm groaning and putting on you wrong, he says, I can't groan loud enough to be commensurate with what I'm suffering. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. Job says, I wish I could get to God. I would go before him and lay my case before him and say, I don't understand. I don't understand why you've let this happen to me. And I want to know. I'm not sure God ever did answer him. But what happened to Job was for the good of Job. That's the first thing. The second, what happened to Job was for the glory of God. You see, God's character had been impugned. The thing that had happened was, was terrible. The question is, is Job a time server? God has put about him everything, and he's given him everything like a spoiled child. And Satan says... That's the reason he serves you. You have to have paid lovers. You have to bribe Job into serving you. You're not really worthy. My beloved, I hope that I'll never be the subject of that kind of a test, I'll be honest with you. But if I hope that if I am, I'll not disgrace God. Are we today time servers? God is so good today. Merciful. Oh, how we can rejoice in his goodness. I stood with a group of preachers this week after I'd spoken to them outside, sun coming down. What a day. They do have nice days up in the Bay Area. I was one of them. And I said, you know, the grace of God is wonderful, isn't it? He gives us all of that. My beloved... It's easy to praise God when the sun is shining. It's easy to praise God when he's good to us. However, it's under trial that we reveal our true metal. Fires burn out the dross. And the real gold comes out through the testing. If all were easy, if all were bright, Where would the cross be? Where would the fight? But in the hard place God gives to you chances for proving what he can do. What was happening to Job was for the glory of God. We're told that we're light in the world. Our Lord said, you're light in the world. And Paul writing to the Philippians said, you're light in the world. My friend, when the sun is shining, you don't need a little candle. It's down in the dark place that God puts many of his own in order that they can be light in the world. God never promised you an easy time. On the contrary, he promised his own a rough time down here. It was old William Penn who knew something about suffering. He says, no pain, no palm, no thorn, no throne, no gall, no glory, no cross, no crown. Exactly what he says, if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. That seems to be the only way. Oh, it's difficult today for us to bow under the awful hand of Almighty God. Paul was writing to believers when he said, Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. God sometimes has to press us down into his mold. 
and we don't fit in it. We don't want to fit into it, for our little will stands up. I wanted to go. He said, stay. I wanted to do. He said, pray. I wanted to work. He said, wait. I wanted to live for his sake. Love me, child, he softly said. Oh, yes, Lord, I bowed my head. I want your way. I am your son, not my will, but thine be done. It's when suffering comes that you and I are able to bow our head. And we have today such a phobia of suffering. Most of us are allergic to it. Well, we've been taught, haven't we? I've heard it again and again since World War II that if you become a Christian, you'll become immune to suffering. Salvation is a sort of an inoculation against trouble. I don't find that in my Bible. That today the scripture is a soothing syrup or a cosmetic that you rub in. We come into this world today in a twilight sleep. We go out under ether, and while we're here, it's an aspirin in the daytime and a tranquilizer at night. Someone has said that man has come through the Stone Age, the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, but this century began with the sofa cushion age, and right now we're living in the rubber foam age. We walk on rubber heels. We sit on rubber cushions, we ride on rubber tires, and we turn our head to rubber when anything goes by that we want to see. And if it's necessary, we'll float a rubber check in order to keep up with the Joneses. May I say to you today, between the birthstone and the tombstone, God says there's a grindstone. And he intends to put us on it in order to develop us if you please, that is his method. That's the way that he says today that he will do it. Listen to the Lord Jesus. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. God nothing does nor suffers to be done but what we would ourselves. Could we but see through all events of things as well as he? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? And Simon Peter wrote this, and he knew something about suffering. Beloved, do not be amazed and bewildered at the fiery ordeal which is taking place to test your quality, as though something strange, unusual, and alien to you and your position were befalling you. But in so far as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, rejoice. So that when his glory is revealed, you may also rejoice with triumph. I've read from the Amplified Testament that particular passage of Scripture this morning. My beloved, may I say to you today that God is permitting you and me today to be tested. That is the proof of his love. That's not a proof of his frown, but a proof of his favor. He does it to test us. For out of this testing, it's good for us, and it brings glory to God. And someday you and I are going to look back on this life and things we do not understand today, we'll understand by and by, and then we'll look back and we'll think, what a sorry mess we made of all of it when we were under fire and under testing. We are moving into a week that speaks of the fact that the Son of God suffered as no one else ever suffered. He did it for your good and God's glory.
He did it that a holy God might reach down and save sinners because he said it was through his suffering many sons are to be brought home to glory. Are you and I to escape altogether? We'd certainly be out of fellowship with him and out of fellowship with multitudes of his saints in heaven. God will test. If you're his child, he can control evil. Not only can he control it, he can save you from sin. That's the great fact of this age in which we are living. God can save lost sinners from sin and bring them to heaven. I'm wondering if you were here this morning, maybe you've been going across purposes to him, actually going away from him, you've never really trusted him because you demanded an explanation of everything and he just hasn't given it to you. But my friend, he died on a cross for your sin and he let one of the ones that he loved above everyone else was Saul of Tarsus who became Paul the Apostles, he said, I have chosen him. He's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before Gentiles, before kings. And I'm going to show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Are you here today, friend? You've had a question mark. You've been a skeptic. But today you'd like to say the best I know how. I'd like to trust this Savior who died for me. Even though this message on suffering has been directed toward believers, we'd like to let those of you who don't have a personal relationship with Christ know that now is the time to receive Him. If you're struggling with the sin in your life weighing you down, you can find freedom from that sin when you turn to Him and receive Him as your Savior. If you'd like more information on God's plan of salvation for your life, then we'd like to send you some helpful material. To request our salvation packet, you can call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE anytime. And when you do call, be sure to include your name, address, and the call letters of this station. If you'd like more information on the issue of suffering, we have a couple of helpful booklets that can assist you in this area. These booklets can help you in understanding how God takes the difficulties in our lives and uses them to make us more Christ-like. The titles are, Why Do God's Children Suffer?, and Job, A Man Stripped Bear. We also have a hardback book called J. Vernon McGee on Comfort. Here are some of the chapter titles. The God of All Comfort, Changing Bitter Waters to Sweet, and What Do You Do With Your Burdens? If you're interested in one of our booklets, a CD copy of today's sermon called Why Do God's People Suffer? and the hardback J. Vernon McGee on Comfort, then contact one of our helpful service operators for ordering information. They can be reached by calling 1-800-65-BIBLE Monday through Thursday from 6 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Pacific Time. This week, we'll continue Dr. McGee's fascinating study through the book of Job as we move ahead in his five-year Bible bus journey through the whole Word of God. If you'd like to receive notes and outlines in our monthly newsletter, you can do so by contacting us by phone when you call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. By email when you use our order form or on our website at ttb.org. Of course, by mail, you can also write to Sunday Sermon in the U.S., Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Now we pray that our God will fill you with His grace, mercy, and peace every moment of every day. Jesus, take it home, all to be my own. Sin hath left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of Through the Bible Radio Network.